So we have a number of uh, excerpts that we're going to read now from Dr. King, as you saw in the back of the bulletin. So just before we get to our uh, readings, our excerpts, we're going to have um, a, a song, uh, Remembering the Movement. On page 20, uh, the back cover, is a song called Freedom is a Constant Struggle. And Kia is going to lead us in that song. on page 17. Uh, these are just excerpts from Dr. King's letter that I referenced earlier that we're going to hit you now. <clears throat> Select readings from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His letter from a Birmingham jail written from a jail cell on April 1963. My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I'm in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC left their villages and carried their thus saith the Lord 
far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. So I am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. We had no alternative except to prepare for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and the national community. We began a series of workshops on nonviolence, and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept the blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. The purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so crisis packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evidenced sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions. We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was, quote, legal. And everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was, quote, legal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I've been gravely disappointed with the white monarch. I've almost reached the gradual conclusion that our great stumbling block to this stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux planner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I do not agree with your methods of direct action. Shouting understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. I hope that the white moderate would understand that the present tension in the South is a necessary phase in the transition from an obnoxious negative which black people passively accepted his unjust claim, to a substantive and positive peace in which all will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creator's attention. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out of the open where it can be seen and dealt with. In your statement, you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But is this a logical assertion? Isn't this like condemning a robbed man because he, his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery? Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his never ceasing devotion to God's will precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? Society must protect the robbed and punish the robber. More and more, I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than have the people of goodwill. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. 
It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. I am grateful to God that through the influence of the church, the way of nonviolence became an integral part of our struggle. I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. Rather, I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled into the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. And now this approach is being termed extremist. But though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained this measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And Abraham Lincoln. This nation cannot survive half slave and half free. And Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or for love? I have been so greatly disappointed with the white church and its leadership. Of course, there are some notable exceptions. I am not unmindful of the fact that each of you has taken some significant stands on this issue. But despite these notable exceptions, I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I have watched white churchmen stand on the sideline and mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I have watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion which makes a strange, unbiblical distinction between body and soul, between the sacred and the secular. I have traveled the length and breadth of the southern states. I have looked at the south's beautiful churches with their lofty spires pointing heavenward. Over and over, I found myself asking, what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Where were their voices when the lips of Governor Barnett dripped with the words of interposition and nullification? Where were they when Governor Wallace gave a clarion call for defiance and hatred? In deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church. But be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. There was a time when the church was very powerful, in the time when early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Whenever the early Christians entered a town, the people in power became disturbed and immediately sought to convict the Christians for being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. Things are different now. So often the contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. Before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson etched the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history, we were here. And yet, out of a bottomless vitality, they continued to thrive and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the internal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. And now Key is going to lead us in another song.
Again, on page 20, if you want to join in singing. Paul and Silas found in jail Had no money for to go their bail Keep your hand on the plow Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Paul and Silas begin to shout. The jail door open and they walk on out. Keep your hand on the plow. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. The only chain that we can stand is that chain of hand in hand. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. We're gonna board that big gray hound, carrying love from town to town. Keep your hand on the plow. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. We've met jail and violence too, but God's love has seen us through. Keep your hand on the plow. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Freedom's name is mighty sweet. Soon one day we're gonna meet. Keep your hand. sent every week, every Thursday, we make 200 bags, 200 and 233 bags uh, that go to three of the local schools. So we're doing it today kind of as a demonstration because of Dr. King uh, weekend, but every week on Thursday uh, at noon, uh, we take all these bags, uh, assemble them, and send them out to local schools. These bags that we're making today, somebody's going to have to help us load them into cars on Thursday. So if you don't get to do enough work today, you can come back on Thursday if you're around at noon time. So thank you all. Thank you everyone who's come at 11. You can come into the room, so welcome. Um, you have a lot, actually more people than I was expecting or hoping for who signed up for this, which is really lovely, so thank you all. I also wanna thank um, UJ Federation, which is sort of the central charitable arm of the New York Jewish community that gave a, a grant that generously sponsored this. And as Pastor O'Hanlon mentioned, right, Food to Grow On, which is a long-standing joint program between this church, St. Paul's, and the Congregation KTI, and the Rotary Club, and, and All Souls, and, and Ryan Presbyterian, um, and lots of other people. Every Thursday at, at noon in, at All Souls down the street, um, there are people packing, and we wanted to move that this week's non of Martin Luther King Day, move it today, because there's obviously lots of people who can't make it at noon on a Thursday. Um, to be able to come and, and have this experience and learn about food to grow on. Um, so Leslie is one of the very dedicated volunteers who works on it. Um, 
let's I guess tell us what's going to happen next um, in terms of packing the bags. We also have T-shirts from UJA in the back. Um, they're sorted by size if you want to take one. And we'll set up somewhere, I don't know where yet, um, a place for, especially if the kids who are here want to make cards to put in the bags. That'll be something extra special. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Food the Grown has been going on since 2011 when somebody noticed that in elementary school the kids get food for breakfast and lunch and then the weekends arrive and there's no one to give them any food to eat. And three day weekends are even more trying because it's three day, it's an extra day without having breakfast and lunch provided. And so Food the Grown started with, with six baths and she heard it's now grown to 233 baths of food. And plus four times a year, big bags are packed for vacation with boxes of cereal, soup, tuna fish, so they helps the families out for during the week. Um, so this week we're packing cans of vegetables, beans, rice, uh, granola bars, packets of oatmeal, and apples. We normally put bananas in also, but because we're packing on Sunday for Thursday, we didn't think the bananas would hold up till Thursday. So we're giving extra an extra apple instead. We're asked to preach the packing. There'll be sort of an assembly line process. Um, there's a lot of people, so maybe I suggest maybe the kids pack more than the adults so the kids can have the experience and understand that there are kids in this down the block who don't have enough food and go to bed hungry every night. Something a lot of us don't think about. Um, so the other way to help out, in addition to today, is there's always food drives. At school, you can raise, collect boxes of cereal, cans of tuna fish. Um, but today, I would suggest the kids, and we need people to twist tie the bags. They need to be twist tied well. Otherwise, when you pick them up, the twist ties go flying off. That's happened many times. And then the contents of the bag don't make it to the child it's supposed to go to. Um, and then we'll need the people to do the not so pleasant job of breaking down the boxes and cleaning up. Um, maybe that would be an adult job. Um, so I appreciate everyone being here, and thank you very much. And looking forward to seeing everybody in the back. Thank you. All right, and we'll, so we'll get started in a moment or two, just with the bags, and Leslie will get everybody organized. And we'll also set up cards, and there are t-shirts also. Thank you all. Now we have a special solo that Key is going to sing for us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Precious Lord, take my 
precious Lord.